Dr. Jeffrey Hergenrather from the US of A uh, in a talk called The Basic Review of Cannabinoid Science for Clinicians. Dr. Jeffrey Hergenrather is a general practitioner specializing in cannabinoid medicine since 1999. His medical experience includes 26 years in emergency medicine and private general practice that includes uh, the medical use of cannabis since 1977. He continues in an active consultation practice in Northern California with face-to-face -face telephone and online consultations for the use of cannabis as medicines. Dr. Hogenrath's practice research and teaching focus on the medicinal uses of cannabis through a wide range of conditions and age groups from infants to elder care. He's a founding member and current president of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, a non-profit corporation dedicated to quality patient care, educational programs and clinical studies. He is a member of the International Cannabinoid Research Society, the ICRS, and the International Association for Cannabinoids in Medicine, the IACM. Additionally, Dr. Hergenrather works as an expert witness and consultant to local governments and industry in creating safe access to cannabis medicines. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Dr. Jeffrey Hergenrather. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate the introduction, and I, I'm delighted to be in Australia. I'm, I'm just, um, it's a thrill to be here and be able to participate in this conference and hopefully make a difference in bringing cannabis to, to Australia. Uh, I'm going to check out and see if this is working properly. Um, is this the right device? Yes, it is. I'm a general physician, a GP, and I've been practicing cannabinoid medicine for 17 years. Actually, my history dates back about 40 years, uh, advocating for cannabis for all kinds of medical conditions as I learned about the benefits of cannabis from my patients. But in the last 17 years, I've opened up a practice in Northern California where I see people on a regular basis for the medicinal use of cannabis. As a GP, I work with everybody from infants to the elderly and all the way to hospice care, uh, depending on whatever condition ails them. So I've had an opportunity to really see a, a huge range of the benefits of cannabis throughout a spectrum of, of medical problems. As mentioned, I'm a founding, founding member and president of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. This is an organization that has a, a helpful website called cannabisclinicians.org. Uh, we educate physicians and educate the docs, or e educate the public in the use of cannabis as medicine. I have no financial relationships to, uh, do, to disclose to you as far as any cannabis medicines. Cannabis is one of the most investigated therapeutically active substances in history, far exceeding probably all pharmaceutical agents. Many of the medicines that come to market are are approved after one or two studies done in-house by the pharmaceutical industry. And we're making a huge fuss over we don't have enough information about cannabis before we allow its use in something that's been here for thousands of years. It doesn't make sense. In a PubMed uh, search looking at endocannabinoid and cannabis in 1993, we see 12 citations for endocannabinoids. Today, in 2016, just a few weeks ago, there were over uh, 7,300 citations. A huge amount of research and papers in this subject. And on cannabis itself, 81 citations in 1993, and in 2016, over 15,000 citations on cannabis. So we have studied this over and over again. We know a lot about this plant. The, it's, our use of cannabis in medicine is really based upon this endocannabinoid system. And I know you've heard a lot about it, but I'll try to bring it to you in a, in a slightly different way to, to make it applicable for clinical medicine. It's, of, co of course, composed of, of receptors like a lock and the ligands like the key. They fit into the receptor. There are also non-cannabinoid receptors that uh, accept these cannabinoids. And there are a variety of proteins that are involved in the, in the synthesis, transport, and metabolism of these molecules. 
errors in these um, genes making these proteins can result in clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndromes. The endocannabinoid system, as you've heard, modulates nervous system and immune system function and provides homeostasis in nearly all creatures in the animal kingdom. In summary, it is spoken of as helping with eating, sleeping, relaxing, forgetting in a good way, and protecting. The endocannabinoid system modulates pain and neuroprotection, immunity, neuroplasticity, inflammation, cancer, emotional memory, and embryological development. The endocannabinoids are synthesized on demand as an adaptive response to a cellular stress aimed at reestablishing the cellular homeostasis. They are rapidly metabolized, usually right there near the site of action. So when we look at the animal kingdom from hydra to humans, we see the endocannabinoid system. It's there and it's working all the time, bringing about homeostasis in these animals. It's in the sea squirt and the fi fish and the mammals and so forth. If we radioactively label THC or other cannabinoids and put them into the body, these hot spots noted with red and orange and yellow are where the cannabinoids will attach. This is where your receptors are most rich in your system. These are the CB1s. The CB2s are more of the immune system side of the, system, uh, of the endocannabinoid system and they are circulating and in our organs. So you see over on the right side of the screen at 102 minutes, they're dappling the liver, the spleen, the gut and bone and lymphatics throughout the body, the tonsils and so forth. They're rich in our immune systems. So if we enumerate where they are, the CB1s on the right are in all of these tissues, the CB2s on the left are all in all of these tissues, the monocytes, the macrophage, the B cells, T cells, liver, spleen, tonsils, and so forth. They're doing their role in these sites. Briefly, I know you haven't seen, I don't believe you've seen these slides today. There's just a few of them. This is a typical, a typical synapse in the nervous system, and it helps us to understand really how this is working. From the top, an action potential, nerve impulse comes down. And when it gets to the tip of this uh, neuron, it releases glutamate, in this case, one of the body's, um, in, uh, one of the body's uh, neurotransmitters, and it's released across the cleft where it finds the, re the receptor on the opposite neuron, which is the postsynaptic cell neuron. So as the calcium channels open, the neurotransmitter glutamate which would be similar in serotonin and dopamine and acetylcholine and, and so forth. All of the neurotransmitters do this same thing. Now when they cross, they, they find the receptor. When the activity is large, the calcium channels open on the postsynaptic uh, receptor cell. And then in response to that, down in the lower right, the endocannabinoid is produced. It crosses in a retrograde fashion across the synapse to find the cannabinoid receptor. And there, when the cannabinoid receptor is activated, the production and release of glutamate is blocked. So it's the circuit breaker in our nervous system. It works to actually create tone in the nervous system. And I think you've heard a lot about that in, in the presentations this morning. If there's not enough activity, it can upregulate the activity by backing down. If the activity is too great and there's a re risk of excitotoxicity or d damage to the nervous system, the cannabinoids come out to block the nervous transmission and protect the cells. True on the inhibitory side, the GABA a neurotransmitter is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and similarly it blocks that as well. So in all cases it's downregulating the way the nervous system is working, in effect protecting it. On the immune system side, it's not so simple to demonstrate what's going on, but I think it is, we know that it is intimately involved in immune function. Activation effectively downregulates immune sensitivity and without really compromising the efficacy of the immune system. So we're not finding that using cannabis is associated with disease or infections. There are a couple papers that I think are particularly interesting in terms of 
our clinical effects, and that is one by the Nagarkotis down in South Carolina. They showed that when looking at the host versus graft reaction, that is transplants, if you put in THC, it has a role in down-regulating that host versus graft reaction. What I'm hearing from patients is that they are, who have had transplants, is that their doctors are pleased to see that they don't need to take so much of the immunomodulator drugs as they're using cannabis to provide some of that function. Another very interesting uh, research paper by Molina out of Mississippi showed that infecting macaque monkeys with the a comparable HIV virus, the simian immunodeficiency virus, some of these animals were then treated with THC. Again, just single molecule THC. And what she found is that the THC treated monkeys, it had an amelioration of disease progression, attenuation of the viral load and tissue inflammation, significantly reducing the morbidity and mortality of the SIV infected macaque monkeys. It's helping these animals to have the THC aboard. It protects them. So this is a brief list. Well, it's not a brief list. It's a long list, but it's not complete of some of the pharmacologic actions that we can expect from cannabinoids. I won't read them, but you know, just pan over them to recognize that there's a huge array of pharmacologic actions that we can expect from cannabinoids. You know, as years have gone by, we've gone from saying, oh, cannabis, you know, it helps with everything, sarcastically, to realize, yeah, it pretty much helps with everything. Let's look at the cannabinoid receptor for a minute. On the right, we see a string of amino acids, each dot being an amino acid, in what is the CB1 or the CB2 receptor. The CB1 is a longer chain. It's the one rooted in the, immune, or in the nervous system. The CB2, a little shorter chain, is the mobile one in the immune system. I think it's particularly interesting to note that research has shown that if you substitute just one amino acid in this chain of, what, 472 amino acids in the CB1 and 360 amino acids in the CB2, one amino acid alteration will provide an, a measurable difference in the function of this endocannabinoid system. It just doesn't work the same. Again, the molecule, after putting these strings of amino acids together, forms a, a, a socket that goes to the membrane of the cell where it sets up to receive the cannabinoids. The trafficking is complex, and I think you've gathered that from the talks already. There are multiple targets for multiple different endocannabinoids and activation of the endocannabinoid receptors may result in different downstream actions depending on which receptor is activated by which endocannabinoid. So we have basically the CB1 and CB2 receptors that we're talking about, but there are others. The TRPB1 receptor or capsaicin receptor, the GBR55 receptors, the PPAR receptors, they can all also be activated by endocannabinoids. And Two, there are voltage-gated ion channels and ligand-gated ion channels similarly affected by cannabinoids. So moving on to this, we have anandamide and 2-AG as the primary endocannabinoids, and they often work in sort of a push-pull relationship in the body. When one is high, the other is low, and that is reversed. Even in fertilization, once an ovum is fertilized, 2-AG uh, is quite high and anandamide is low. As the ovum goes down to the uterus, that relationship reverses where anandamide is high and important for implantation and 2-AG is low. So they work in concert together. There are also some, well, th this is a slide just to show that these two endocannabinoids come basically from arachidonic acid derivatives by combining with glycerol, you have 2-AG, and with an ethanolamine, ethanolamine, you have uh, AEA or anandamide. They're metabolized by two different metabolic pathways. Here are a couple of, or several of the other endogenous cannabinoids beyond anandamide and 2-AG. These, nolidin, NADA, vodoramine, for, uh, for a few of the names, 
are other endocannabinoids and they're doing particular uh, roles within the body as well. Now the point works up to this. Endocannabinoid systems don't all work the same. And I think that's quite what Dr. Labrusso is pointing out in the clinical endocannabinoid deficiencies. There's really a spectrum of endocannabinoid deficiency syndromes. This is partly from McPartland and partly from uh, Russo's work, but these are implicated in human endocannabinoid deficiencies. So we know this much so far, there are others yet to be added to this list. And quite frankly, when I see a young person come into my practice and say, I've got MS and Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis, I'm looking at this person saying, you've got an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome and it would do you well to augment your system with cannabinoids because it will make a huge difference in your, in your comfort and longevity. It's not that we don't know this at NIH and in the federal government in the United States. Pocker and Kunos in, two years ago said in their paper, modulating endocannabinoid activity, activity may have therapeutic potential in almost all diseases affecting humans, including and then the laundry list to follow. It's not that they don't know that these, that cannabinoid activation may not work. It's just that they want to keep the plant illegal and make it available only by way of the pharmaceutical industry. This is the politics of cannabis and it's present here as it is in the rest of the world. In fact, the federal government patented cannabinoids as a class of drugs in 2003. So again, not, you know, it's quite evident that they realized the potential. It was in doing animal research where they would damage the animals with ligating blood vessels going to the brain, creating strokes. If you treat them with cannabinoids, it may diminish or even eliminate the stroke, whereas those that didn't have the protection went on and developed larger strokes. So they realized from the get-go that the cannabinoids had this tremendous protective role. Whole plant cannabis and can cannabinoids as therapeutic agents is then what we're talking about. We've heard about Marinol, which is one of the synthetic cannabinoids, THC rather, it's available in three sizes of capsules. It's available, let me just put it that way. Uh, Sesamet, I have never seen used, it's supposedly a parenteral uh, synthetic THC analog. Sativex you've heard about today, it's a one-to-one -one blend of THC and CBD, now in phase three clinical trials. Epidiolex we're using for pediatric seizures, note that it's 99% CBD and 1% non-THC cannabinoids. Let me add a line there to just say, taking THC out is a political decision. It really has nothing to do with whether it's uh, beneficial for seizures. We've known for decades that THC works for seizures. We're taking it out for political reasons. When the kids don't get a good response or adults don't get a good response with CBD, we bring in the THC and we have a better medicine. So some might ask, well, we have synthetic THC or Marinol already available. What's the problem? Why do we have to have this plant? Well, as you've heard, Marinol is a single isolated synthetic cannabinoid. It's one of You've heard somewhere between 60 and, a, and maybe 100 different active cannabinoids in the plant. Uh, Marinol lacks the synergistic effect of multiple cannabinoids, flavonoids, and terpenes. The non-THC components of the plant, including the terpenes and the non-THC cannabinoids, have all kinds of various therapeutic properties, which include on the short list, neuroprotection, bone stimulation, they're antipsychotic, antiepileptic, antibacterial, antidiabetic, vasorelaxant, anxiolytic, antispasmodic, and analgesic. So why wouldn't we use a, a medicine that includes all of these other molecules with great medicinal properties? Marinol itself, as you probably recognize from the talks already, is highly psychoactive and in many cases dysphoric. So patients really presented with the opportunity to use one or the other that is to say, Marinol versus the whole plant, invariably like using the whole plant. It simply works better. Now I'll take you through a little bit of chemistry. I think this is accessible, but I'll, I'll test you on it in a minute. 
Uh, site two is a, is a carbon atom you see there toward the right. Uh, site three is where there's a five carbon chain atta attached to this molecule. That's the end of the molecule, like the key that fits into the cannabinoid receptor. Over on positions five and six in the lower left-hand corner, we have the differences where CBD comes in. And I'll show you these. To the upper left, we have delta-9 THC. It has a five carbon chain, as you see a tail, if you will. To the right, we have cannabidiol. It too has a five carbon chain, but once a single hydrogen atom moves from the, the carbon at position six to the oxygen at position five, it saturates that, opens the ring, changes the shape of the molecule. Now we have a molecule that isn't psychoactive. It has pretty much all the same therapeutic spectrum as THC, but it's not psychoactive, so it gives us a great tool to use in medicine. Look at THCV. It's basically the same molecule as THC, except note that it's a three carbon tail. The tail doesn't get down in the receptor far enough, so it can't activate the cannabinoid receptor. It actually acts as a partial antagonist and has therapeutic value in that sense as well. I'll divert for a second to say that as cannabinoid blockers were developed, they were developed for research purposes. And Sanofi Aventis put one on the market a few years ago, ago called Romanabant. And it rapidly was accepted around uh, Europe as a diet drug because it interfered with the cannabis receptor. It actually blocks the cannabinoid receptor. And when you do that, they didn't look toward the risks of the consequences of blocking our cannabinoid receptors. And they ended up with depression and suicides suicides. So blocking the CB1 receptor is a bad idea. We want to upregulate the endocannabinoid system in general as far as therapeutic options. You can do that temporarily with things such as massage and manipulation and exercise and acupuncture. These will temporarily upregulate your endocannabinoid system. Similarly, acetaminophen and the non anti-inflammatory medicines can temporarily upregulate the endocannabinoid system by inhibiting FA, that FAH enzyme that breaks down anandamide. Well, if you're inhibiting FA, then the natural anandamide builds up a little greater and you get a pain relieving anti inflammatory effect. So, what we're doing in clinical medicine with cannabinoids is trying to optimize our clinical effects by augmenting and controlling for these various variables. One is the method of administration. Smoke and vapor, top on the list. And after 17 years in this practice, still far more than half, probably 70% of my patients prefer smoking as their method of administration. It's not that I haven't encouraged them to vaporize or to use oral products. I do that regularly. But they'll come back to me and say, well, doc, I just do best with a little smoke. So what about the risks? Donald Tashkin is a professor emeritus of pulmonary medicine at UCLA. He's been on the payroll of the federal government for almost 45 years, trying to show that smoked cannabis caused cancer or other disease. And his conclusions after looking into this for all of these years is that number one, it does not cause cancer of the larynx, pharynx, trachea, lung, or esophagus. And in fact, when you look at the large epidemiologic study that he did, there was a 37% reduction in the risk of developing lung cancer if you were a tobacco smoker. So it has this protective role when it's inhaled into the lung. Now I'm first to admit that it causes irritation of the lung membranes and is associated with bronchitis. I'll speak to this again. Oral forms, bioavailability is really variable, as it is with smoke and vapor. I mean, you can imagine lighting a joint and letting it largely burn up with a few puffs and you don't hold it in. You can have very little actually absorbed. So bioavailability is quite a large range depending on the way you're using this. Similarly, in oral forms, it depends on what you're eating at the same time. If you have a large bulky meal, a lot of fiber, you may not absorb the cannabinoids so well. A smaller meal, an oily meal, where once mixed with the bile acids is absorbed into the gut, 
that seems to be associated with better absorption. Let me note then here that from the distal esophagus all the way to the rectum, all of the venous supply going from the gut back into the body goes to the liver first. And there it's metabolized in what is known as first pass metabolism. You can reduce or eliminate first pass metabolism by smoking it or vaporizing it. And you can also reduce it significantly when you put a suppository into the rectum or vagina because you're absorbing these molecules in what ends up coming back into the body through the vena cava back to the heart and not to the liver first. So by avoiding this first pass metabolism, people using suppositories m greatly reduce the psychoactivity of a very large dose of cannabinoids. This is increasingly being used with cancer patients who really want to get a dose, a large dose, to see if cannabinoids are going to have a beneficial effect in reducing the viability of the cancer or killing the cancer cells. Topical uses are amazing. I wish I had enough time to fully cover this subject. I could speak an hour on that. But suffice to say, they will reduce skin cancers. They will reduce actinic keratosis. They can be absorbed through the skin and help with pain. Invariably, people say that if they put these tinctures on their skin over a painful joint, they will get a reduction in pain. So method of administration, you really end up letting the patient choose what works best for them. You'll give them some options, give them some ideas, but they're going to have to choose for themselves what works best. In pain, for example, you might want both an ingested form and an inhaled form because the inhaled form is going to work so quickly and the ingested form is going to take a long time and be metabolized rather slowly. Oh shoot, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> Excuse me. So here's what I wanted, wanted to show you next. Phytocannabinoid metabolism is all about the way that it's broken down in the body. The plant, the plant cannabinoids are metabolized in the liver. The endogenous endocannabinoids are metabolized in the brain and in the sites where they're being used. Now, genetic variations in the hepatic cytochrome P450 metabolic pathways is manifest by different rates of metabolism from person to person. We have slow metabolis metabolizers on one hand and fast metabolizers on the other hand. Somebody will take a big dose like a cookie or something and they'll say that mm, five hours, I'm fine again. Another person will use it and say, the next day is, is what it takes. You know, it's 18 hours or even longer before it's fully metabolized. So we see quite a range in, in the way that people handle ingested cannabinoids and smoked cannabinoids for that matter too. Some people just don't really like cannabis. And so they may in fact be getting these higher blood levels or slower metabolism as a reason why this just isn't their drug of choice. We do expect a wide range of, of phytocannabinoid blood levels and duration of action uh, that can be expected in developing treatment plans for patients. So it's not simple. It's not one dose fits all. You really have to adjust as you go. I like these two slides coming up. This is smoked cannabis and you'll see THC is the shorter dotted line. You get a rapid spike at about 10 minutes after inhaling cannabis, whether smoked or, or vaporized, either way. You'll see the long dotted line is the 11-hydroxy-THC. This is that first pass metabolite in the liver that I spoke of, a highly psychoactive molecule and really responsible for that super stony pe feeling that people can get when they're in ingesting cannabis. The inactive metabolite called 11 nor 9 carboxy thc is the solid line and it persists for weeks which makes it very handy for law enforcement because it hangs around the body whereas the active metabolites in smoked cannabis are gone in about two or three hours. Ingested cannabis, quite a different curve. You see the thc is actually the lowest of the curves here. Because it's going to the gut first, that first pass metabolism is breaking down THC to the 11 hydroxy form uh, in that first few hours, peaking at about two hours and then lasting for about six, eight, 10 hours before it's fully metabolized. I should note that this is a, 
a composite of many people's metabolisms. It's not the way everybody works. So in keeping with what I already said, some people are going to metabolize a much shorter time. Some people this is going to run much longer. But I think it's important to note that when you ingest cannabis, the THC is not the highest amount of molecule you get in your system. It's the 11-hydroxy that's circulating after it gets into your system from the liver. So dosing and frequency of dosing, I do see something in the range of a milligram of cannabinoids might be a sufficient dose in some people. On average, maybe a five milligram dose is, a, is an adequate dose in most people. But there's a huge range there as well. If we go to a, a one to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day and we're treating a cancer or even a seizure disorder, we may have people using hundreds of milligrams of cannabinoids in order to achieve the effect that they're after. As far as the frequency of dosing, well, some people are using it on an ad needed basis. So, or, so that people with migraine, maybe they're just feeling an aura and they'll use cannabis then. Maybe they're using it prophylactically and they use it every day. Daily administration is common, uh, usually bedtime and evening time after people get home from their day's business. Uh, frequent and multiple time daily administration is also common in cannabis patients. Those that are retired or at home may be able to use cannabis as a preferred method. They might smoke or vaporize cannabis. They may be using it every other hour in order to get an optimal effect. This isn't addiction. This is using the medicine for what it is able to do. So we have frequency of use, and then we go on to cannabinoid ratios, or the THC-CBD ratio. Marijuana typically is about 99% THC in the cannabinoids, and 1% all the other cannabinoids, including CBD. When Harborside, one of our dispensaries in Oakland, began looking at every cannabis that came across their counter before they sold it. This began about eight years ago. It was one in 650 plants that was elevated in CBD to where the CBD and the THC were more or less equal. Not commonly encountered, but we have the nice opportunity of Fred Gardner, who produces the O'Shaughnessy's magazine, would get a call from the lab. He would go out to the grower and say, you have a strain of medicinal interest if they had a CBD-rich product. And then frequently, the growers of these cannabis strains would give this over for medicinal use. Now we have scores of CBD-rich cannabis that are available to patients and now propagated all over the world. Hemp, of course, is a CBD-dominant plant. If you look at the flowering tops of the hemp that's used for fiber and seed and protein and so forth, it's somewhere around 20 to 1, it could be more or less, but it's predominantly CBD. In the world marketplaces, the THC has to be low enough or it's considered marijuana. It's got to be below this 0.3% dry weight threshold for THC in order to qualify as industrial hemp. And then there are rare strains that we're learning about that are rich in CBG, CBDV, THCV, CBC. These will be available for clinical use as we see them propagated and then using them in various medical conditions to see what they're particularly good for. And then finally, carboxylated versus decarboxylated forms of cannabis. You've heard a little bit about the acid forms. The plant is rich in the acid forms. They are not decarboxylated yet. Again, up there at position two where the carboxyl group is on THCA, in a non-enzymatic decarboxylation, usually accomplished with heating, burning, and so forth, the carboxyl group comes off as CO2, and now we have psychoactive THC. If people take a green bud and put it into a smoothie, they're not going to get stoned as they would if they were decarboxylating first. So some people speak of this as activated or inactivated. I don't agree with that terminology. The THC acid is an active molecule. It may not be an agonist at the receptor, as THC is, but it has still has great pharmacologic use. So when people speak of juicing cannabis or green cannabis, these are the acid forms that they're getting, as opposed to the heated forms, heated, burned, vaporized, baked, and processed cannabis, 
let me note there that processed cannabis, generally speaking, when you extract the oils, whether you're using supercritical CO2 to extract or alcohol to extract, often alcohol and heat are applied in, ex in cleaning up the oil and making it ready for other products, whether it's in vaporizers or whether it's in other products. So as you do that, you basically reduce the amount of acid cannabinoids to zero. You, you don't have any of the acid cannabinoids left and you're reducing the terpene content. So the more highly processed these, these oils are, the more you lose these terpene molecules. So there's something to be at least said for our, you know, an, an argument to say that the whole plant, the fresh flowering tops, may really have more medicine than these ex extracts. So it's not that we don't use the extracts and value them greatly, they're wonderful, but we do sacrifice as far as loss of acid forms and loss of terpenes. If you can smell it, you're losing the terpenes. The terpenes give it fragrance. The cannabinoids are odorless and colorless. Other therapeutic considerations, you've actually heard a good bit about this already. Cannabinoid synergism, I'm going to show a couple slides to highlight what this means. Whole plant versus single molecule. There's a very interesting paper that came out of Israel just a year ago that I'll speak of in a minute. The entourage effect, I think you get the point. You get all of these molecules together, it works better as medicine. And then cannabis is an adaptogen. I really like what the naturopaths are doing to our understanding of can cannabis in the United States. They're calling cannabis an adaptogen. In other words, you get what you need. The same marijuana that you may use at bedtime to help go to sleep is the same marijuana that you may use in the morning to get up and go. It's an adaptogen. You get what you need. If you're hungry, it'll help with your appetite. Or if you're tired, it'll help you with sleep. It's about homeostasis. Tolerance and autoregulation. I think a bit has been said about this too, but I, I want to point out just a thing or two here. If you use a large dose of cannabis in, in hopes or cannabis extract or oils to see if it's going to work on a cancer, in about a week's time, maybe less, you'll become tolerant of that high dose. What's happening in the cell is that the cannabinoids are coming out of the, the cannabinoid receptor is coming out of the cell membrane and internalizing into the cell to where it's basically taken offline. So when you do that, you're auto-regulating these cannabinoid receptors, down-regulating the effect in a sense, but you're also keeping all of these non-cannabinoid targets still getting this big dose of cannabinoids. So we see some great effects on cancers as people continue to use these high doses of cannabinoids. In some people, you don't need a very large dose, and I'll speak of that if we have the time. Synergism. Barbara Koster, coming out of Italy, has written about synergism in a rat pain model for many years. And she taught us a few years back that THC reduced pain in the animal rat model of pain. And CBD reduced it as well. So both THC and T CBD similarly reduced pain. But when you put the two together, it had a much more dramatic effect in pain relief. More recently, she has a paper on cannabis sativa extracts Again, whole plant extracts, and this seems to be uh, working best as far as that goes. Again, now you're adding all the terpenes and flavonoids to this mix, and it's a better medicine. Marku and McAllister write about the synergism in CBD and THC when it comes to cancer. This is, these next two slides are from their research paper. On the left, we have the black column showing just nutrient growing a brain tumor cell, the glioblastoma brain tumor cell, very, very deadly tumor. Then in the second column, you've added THC in this quantity of 1.7 micromolar per liter. You see that it knocked down the viability of these tumor cells about 30%. On the next column, the CBD is added to the growth medium, or I should say the tumor cells, and it knocked it down about 20%. And then to the far right, you see the two together. This is synergism. THC and CBD have a greater than additive effect when it comes to the synergism of killing cancer cells. You don't want to, 
You know, I hear this all the time now. Oh, I hear CBD is great for cancer. They may even have gone online and bought some CBD. Well, I don't know exactly what's there, but I can tell you that the blends of THC and CBD coming close to even proportions is a stronger medicine when it comes to killing cancer cells. Now let's go up threefold on the THC and twofold on the CBD. You see these columns are shorter still. This points to the dose response. The bigger the dose, the bigger the response. We've seen that in cancers as well, where a big dose will finally knock down the growth of some of those resistant cancers like pancreatic cancer. And in some of these, well again, I should say, look at the combination of the THC and CBD together on the lower right. It almost completely blo blocks the growth of the cancer cells. This is the paper that came out of uh, Israel a short time ago, just a year ago. And they were set telling us that there's a bell-shaped dose response curve of cannabidiol. Think of a bell, bell curve. Starts low, peaks, and comes back down again. If you're treating pain in an animal model and inflammation in an animal model where you give CBD, if you give a little bit of the medicine, it doesn't do much. If you give just the right amount of CBD, it has a peak effect. And if you keep going up on the CBD, it falls out again, and you don't get the effect any longer. Now, they contrasted that to the cannabis from the CBD from whole plant cannabis, where CBD was the dominant cannabinoid, and now you're blending it with all these other cannabinoids and terpenes. Now the curve is linear. The bigger the dose, the bigger the effect. So again, I would point out caution when utilizing highly purified CBD or cannabinoids uh, that come from industrial sources. This is a byproduct in the hemp industry around the world, whether it's coming from China or Eastern Europe or wherever it might be. Cannabinoids are being used as a, are being produced as a byproduct to the production of these fibers and seeds and so forth. So what are our limitations? The biggest are legal and social. I can't tell you what the drug war has done to America. In my opinion, it has just about wrecked our country. We are arresting kids and people of all ages at a rate of about three quarters of a million people a year and giving them charges, incarceration, basically wrecking their lives. We're making it so that the kids can't get student loans. What worst thing could we do for kids to see them experimenting with cannabis and throw them in jail and saddle them with a crime that will follow them the rest of their lives. It just isn't right. <laughs> Cost is a significant problem. When you're growing it in your yard, it is not a problem. And in California, we can do this. Any patient can grow at least six plants in your, in your yard. And what we know in California, our law allows for any other condition for which it provides relief, and we can grow an amount sufficient to meet our needs. So you may need 30 plants. You may need one plant. You don't really know. And as, far, as a farmer of olives and apples in Sebastopol, you don't know what you're going to get for your crop after the blossom. You may have expectations about what you're going to get, but it may not be so. So to be taking people down and arresting them because they grew more than they thought they were going to grow, again, is senseless. We do have limited access to products that are cleanly grown and produced with specific cannabinoid ratios. This is getting better all the time, and CBD medicine is available more and more as the time goes along. Risk of discovery is a big problem in the United States especially since a company can drug test you and fire you if you're using cannabis unrelated to being impaired. If it's just in your system, you can be fired from your job. So risk of discovery is a big deal. Altered performance, yes, I'll put in a word. You don't want to go to work stoned. I mean, maybe a, 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 a fine arts painter or a or a poet or something might uh, go to work and smoke cannabis. But for most of us, you do alter your performance. Your short-term memory, memory is diminished. You get forgetful. That's not the shape you want to be in if you're a, a switchboard operator. So for the most part, people are using cannabis after work and in the evening time. Adverse effects, 
not much going on here. Dry mouth, dry mucous membranes, injected eyes, sleepy, woozy, loss of balance. Those can occur. Mostly people get accustomed to it and know what a dose is and these aren't a problem. Precautions. Anxiety and panic is not unusual in the neophyte. In the person who's totally novice, they may use cannabis. Suddenly they think they're dying, end up in an ER. Once the ER staff learns that it's marijuana that is the issue, they'll have a chuckle and give them a quiet room to sleep it off. It's, it's not a big deal. Syncope and fall risk, yes, that can be a problem. And especially since we have what is called dabs now in the United States. Basically, you may have it here too. If you take the very concentrated cannabis oils and take a puff of that all in one inhalation, you may get about a whole joint in one breath. And it may knock you on your can. You get vasodilatation, you faint, you fall, and you hurt yourself. So syncope is a risk, especially when mixed with hot tubs and alcohol and other things that may uh, reduce your uh, ability to uh, deal with the vasodilatation associated with cannabis. Smoking, yes, does cause bronchitis. It's not a big problem. It does not lead to COPD or emphysema. Uh, Dr. Tashkin, I have queried him more than once in whether I should be doing pulmonary function tests on my new patients. He said, no, 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 I've done that. It does not cause COPD, emphysema, or cancers of the lung or airways. Habit forming, I'll call it that. Addictive, no. We've changed the definition of addiction to encompass cannabis. It is not an addictive drug. People can use large amounts, quit, and for whatever reason, maybe they've gone to visit their family or gone on a vacation. They don't take any cannabis along. And so there is no significant withdrawal from the use of cannabis. Drug-drug interactions. The C, cytochrome P450 metabolic pathway in the 2C and 3A families is important when, you, when it comes to carbamazepine or clobazam. This is an anticonvulsant, rarely used, but in conjunction with high doses of CBD, which inhibits these cytochromes, it can cause an upregulation of the anticonvulsant. So you've got to follow the drug level of certain anticonvulsants if you're on very high doses of cannabinoids. What about that association with schizophrenia and psychosis? There's one study that hasn't been mentioned today that I think is worthy of mention. It's a Great Britain study looking at about 2.5% of the English population over the decade from 1995 until 2005. And during that decade, there was an 18-fold increase in the use of cannabis in their 18 and younger population. Big increase in pot smoking in the youth in Great Britain. During that time in the clinic system, there was no increase in schizophrenia or psychosis. And their conclusions were simply, you cannot, there is no association between the use of cannabis and the development of schizophrenia and psychosis. Association with hyperemesis, there is a syndrome. People like to take a hot shower when they stop, start vomiting. After a day of abstinence, their receptors reset. I don't think we know everything about this. There's probably a combination of genetics and saturation of the receptors to result in a hyperemesis syndrome. It isn't a big deal. Five out of my 2,500 patients have described what I would say is hyperemesis. So yes, it occurs. I don't think it's a problem. Conflicting reports on fibrosis with hepatitis C. We know that CBD blocks fibrosis in the liver. THC could induce fibrosis, but clinically we're not really seeing it in my patient population. It just doesn't seem to progress in that way. But I think it's worthy of cautioning people who are using cannabis for symptoms of hepatitis C to suggest that there could be some increased fibrosis. I don't think it's really true, but I think it's worthy of further research. Fetal and neonatal development appears to be unharmed. If you look at the work by Melanie Dreher, she was a nurse that went to Jamaica back in the 90s. May have even started in the 80s. And she, what she did is she picked out a bunch of moms that were pregnant. Those were the heavy ganja smoking moms. And she got match controls with moms that weren't smoking pot. And she followed them through their births and delivery in the first neonatal month of life. And during that interval, she didn't see any problems at all 
associated with heavy use of cannabis in these moms. She published the paper in pediatrics. Several years later, she went back to look at the kids to see how they were doing. They were doing great. The, the kids of the pot-smoking moms were actually doing better than the control moms. She tried to get the paper published in pediatrics. She had effectively been blackballed and the paper was not published by them. This is typical. So, you know, what the naysayers were saying was, well, this is the Earth Mother Syndrome, meaning that the pot-smoking moms were just better moms. Take it for what it's worth. <laughs> These are the clinical conditions that I'm seeing in my practice in rank order, starting with pain. I see no better pain medicine for neuropathic pain and chronic pain than cannabis, in conjunction with, with opioids. Probably at least half of my patients discontinue their use of opioids when they're using cannabinoids. Mental disorders of all kinds are benefiting. Even the schizophrenic patients are benefiting. It gives them a holiday from their schizophrenia. They like it. It helps them relax. Cancers, not all cancers, but many cancers. Gastrointestinal disorders pretty much across the board. And I'll show you some slides associated with some uh, research that I did a few years ago. Insomnia, yes, it helps get to sleep. People report improved quality and duration of sleep when using cannabinoids. Migraine headache, we've been hearing about, yes, it helps. Harm reduction, we've heard about, yes, it helps. I've been treating opiate withdrawal with cannabinoids since the 70s, and I, I see no better choice than that. It works quite well. Spastic disorders, a puff of cannabis can stop a, a spasm in seconds. There's no better medicine, in my opinion, than cannabis when it comes to spastic disorders as an inhaled medicine. Autoimmune disorders of all kinds. This includes MS, rheumatoid arthritis, oh, scleroderma, Sjogren's disease, and so forth. Many of these patients have not had a flare-up in their systemic lupus or their or their autoimmune disease ever since they started using cannabis. They're not all that way. Again, we have a genetic variability here, but many patients find that their autoimmune disease just comes to a halt when using cannabinoids. Other neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, Huntington's, and so forth, these benefit as well. It doesn't stop the disease, maybe can slow the progression, we don't really know. Glaucoma, let me make one note here. THC lowers intraocular pressure, CBD does not. The combination of cannabinoids probably work best together, and it may be the neuroprotection that's more important than it is actually lowering the pressure in the eye. So it's protecting the nerves from injury from the elevated pressures. Skin diseases, eczema, psoriasis, and on and on. Many people are using cannabinoids for these problems and some of the others that I mentioned earlier, the skin cancers, the actinic keratoses, and so forth. If you put concentrated cannabis oil on what might be a skin cancer, it may kill it off in a matter of weeks or days. If you have a melanoma, I would run to the surgeon, don't get me wrong, but I would use cannabinoids after, especially if it's felt that you had metastatic disease. Epilepsy, autism, I can't tell you the tear-jerking stories of these families coming with autistic kids giving their kids cannabis for the first time and seeing their lives change on the spot. They start talking, they start reading, they want to go to school, they want to be participants. You know, there's a range here as well, but in general, cannabinoids are very, very helpful for autism. Tourette's, ADD, ADHD, dystonias, dementias. I've had a unique opportunity with a doc in, in my community to treat dementias. And this is a great medicine for people with severe dementia, moderate to severe dementia. I'll move on to that in a minute. AIDS and other infections also benefit greatly and symptom relief may have an effect on the progression of the disease as well. This has been covered already. We have flowering tops, oils, tinctures, infused oils. People will grow their cannabis, bring it into their kitchen infuse it into olive oil or ghee or butter and have their medicine, simple as that. At least their oral medicine if they choose not to burn it or heat it. Suppositories I've given some mention to. Cocoa butter melts right at room at body temperature, so it's particularly valuable when it comes to the uh, pharmacist to use cocoa butter as the choice when you're making suppositories. Foods and candies, that goes without saying. 
So briefly, pain, I've kind of covered it. Well, let me back up a second. Epilepsy, epilepsy autism, Tourette's, there's gonna be more said about these things. I'll mention a little more about dementia. Cancers, I have a couple slides for, and GI disorders as well. So I'll run through these. I know you guys are getting hungry and tired of sitting. Acute pain, chronic pain, persistent inflammatory pain, neuropathic pain, all benefit with the use of cannabis. There is a synergism between the opioids and the cannabinoids. In um, looking at this, there's kind of a, a crosstalk between these two signaling pathways. It shows promise for using cannabinoids and opioids together. And like I mentioned, many patients are able to discontinue their opioids in favor of cannabinoids. There is a, a couple research papers that, well, maybe I'll just move on. I think, I think we're short on time. Suffice to say that cannabinoids do work well in pain. Dementia. Those with Alzheimer's disease commonly have problems with agitation, anxiety, psychosis, restlessness, anorexia, anger, aggression, depression, pain and spasms and insomnia. When we're using cannabis in this population, we go to them not with a capsule to take, we go to them with a brownie. Make it interesting, tasty, so they're happy to get it. What's that that you're giving me? Oh, this is your cannabis medicine, and they readily take it down. What is it doing for them? Lisa Eubanks, a decade ago, showed that delta-9-THC competitively inhibits the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, increasing the cleft acetylcholine, and prevents the acetylcholinesterase-induced amyloid beta deposition and aggregation. These are the key pathologic markers in Alzheimer's disease. In the end of her abstract, she says, compared to currently approved drugs for Alzheimer's disease, THC is considerably superior inhibitor of the amyloid beta degradation, or aggregation, sorry. This may mean that it can slow the progression or prevent the progression to Alzheimer's disease. We need some studies. But suffice to say, THC and the cannabinoids do function well in this role of preventing this beta amyloid deposition. The FDA has no approved drugs for agitation. Conventional medicines are used in those patients with Alzheimer's disease, antidepressant, anxiolytics, antipsychotics, sleep and pain meds. Nonetheless, symptom control is elusive and difficult to control. So what's used are these black box warning drugs in many cases. Black box warning, what that means, if you look at the package insert, it says right there in a black box, warning, increased mortality in elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis. This is a list of some of them that carry that warning. It's not a complete list by any means, but if people's behavior is bad, what do the docs do? They increase the use of these drugs, and that subjects them to an increase of dying from the use of these drugs in managing these symptoms. So what do we do? We're measuring their agitated behaviors. I know these are too small to read, but there are 29 agitated behaviors here. Cursing, hitting, kicking, grabbing, pushing, and so forth and so forth. These are typical in somebody with moderate or severe Alzheimer's disease. On this other scale, one through seven, we have from none to hourly, as far as the frequency of these agitated behaviors. So it's quite easy then to start them on cannabis and follow their progress as to the benefits that they're getting with the use of cannabinoids. And in general, this is exactly what we're seeing. We're getting great results from patients with, with dementia, with Alzheimer's dementia, in reducing these agitated behaviors. Cancer. I won't spend long. We're going to get more on this coming up. Suffice to say, we have CB1, CB2, and TRPV1 receptors that are receptor targets for killing cancer cells. We also have non-cannabinoid receptor pathways, and I've alluded to this already. And I just listed some of them out of the PubMed. There are probably more. This was derived a couple years ago, and honestly, we know a lot about these non-receptor targets of cannabinoids in stopping the growth of cancer cells. There's one interesting paper that looks the other direction. 
Remember I was talking about Ramanaband, the blocker, the antagonist of the cannabinoid receptor. Sanofi Aventis came to the FDA and still wanted to license, in, license it in the United States because we're, we're a great uh, population when it comes to obesity, as you know. So if you give this drug, Ramanaband, which is known as SR141716, to mice, they develop precancerous adenomatous lesions throughout their gut. They grow, they proliferate at, a, at an unnatural rate. So what we understand from this is the CB1 receptor and normal cannabinoid function is necessary to extinguish those cells. And if we interfere with it, tumors proliferate. So the researchers at MD Anderson Hospital, a great cancer institute, recognized that cannabinoids would be sensible to use not only for the prevention of bowel cancers, but for the treatment of bowel cancers. Here's the pictures of a little kiddo that came to me with his parents when he was 16 months of age. He started to have some cross eyes and funny eye movements at about 15 months of age. They went to the doc and got an image. And there in the MRI scan on the column on the far left is a big white tumor on both sides of his brain. The surgeon said, can't touch it. You'll, I'll, we'll kill your son to take this tumor out. The radiation docs and the chemo docs both said, we have treatments for you. And when they asked the hard questions, they weren't happy with the story that they got about what these treatments were going to do to their kid. So instead, they came to me to see, what about cannabis? What about cannabis oil? So we began putting the cannabis oil as a, concentrated, as a concentrate onto his pacifier twice a day, the late morning nap and before bedtime. You'll see the next column is three months out. The tumor is fading. This is a solo therapy. We're not doing anything else to this kid other than just a healthy diet. Five months into the treatment, the tumor has virtually disappeared and has remained gone ever since. So th this kid is running around the office playing, and as the parents come in for the follow-up visits with this kiddo, we hardly need to speak to each other. This is just a wonderful thing to see. So this is a, a list of some of the cancers that I'm seeing sensitivity. It's anecdotal, I admit, but these are the tumors that I'm seeing responses in. Either they've had conventional therapy, now they're using cannabis and have had no recurrences, or they may be using it right from the start. Uh, I do seem to see particular sensitivity to some, not all, of the glioblastomas. GBM is a very deadly tumor. And some of my patients using a relatively small amount of cannabinoids, maybe uh, 100 milligrams or less of cannabinoids in a day, have never had the progression of the disease and have had tumors that are residual after, after surgery shrinking away. Thyroid cancers, papillary lung carcinomas, hepatic carcinomas seem to be particularly sensitive. In several uh, patients with this cancer, the tumors are going away. Pancreatic carcinoma, a tough one, seems to be sensitive to very high doses of cannabinoids. Colon cancer, breast cancer, particularly the triple negative breast cancer, negative in HER2 nu, progesterone and estrogen receptors. Those are often the most aggressive of the breast cancers. They seem to be the most sensitive as well. Ovarian, renal cell carcinoma, another sensitive cancer, another one not well treated with conventional therapy. Prostate adenocea, lymphomas, leukemias, the chronic and acute lymphocytic leukemias seem to show sensitivity to cannabinoids. Neuroblastoma, a very dead, deadly childhood tumor went away after a kid started smoking cancer, a cannabis. He started when he was nine years old. He had already had the disease three years, and he was on his deathbed on hyperalimentation therapy when he started smoking cannabis. It made him feel better. He started to eat. I saw him when he was 11. He had had his last intraoperative radiation and debulking operation. And by the time he was 13 years of age, no tumor was found. Melanomas, sarcomas, also sensitive to cannabinoids. Again, not across the board. We need some markers to look at the tumors to see which ones are going to be sensitive to cannabinoids. We don't know this yet, and it's, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out, but we're not getting help from the NIH because this would be helping out the 
medical marijuana field and not the pharmaceutical industry's interests. GI disease. I don't have much time here, but suffice to say, we know that there are a lot of receptors in the bowel wall and in the brain stem down there in the, in the vagus nerve roots. Both CB1s predominantly, some CB2s in the brain and then going into the bowel, both the CB1s and the CB2s are present. What do they do? They lower esophageal sphincter relaxation when activated. So cannabis does this. It effectively keeps the sphincter tight at the top of the stomach, preventing reflux. It reduces gastric acid secretions. It reduces intestinal motility. It reduces intestinal secretions. So patients with Crohn's disease do particularly well because they have fewer stools and can really rely on a, a much more comfortable life when using cannabinoids. On the CB2 side, we see that they reduce visceral pain and inflammation and motility as well. So we got together about 45 patients, 38 actually completed this, the survey. We asked them to respond to these 11 things, 11 signs and symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease. And I'll run through the slides to show the response. Each pair of columns comes from each patient. The blue column being with the use of cannabis, the red column being without the use of cannabis. So you can see that the stools per day diminished from a mean of five and a half stools a day down to 3.7 stools per day. Pain, markedly reduced. Appetite, markedly upregulated. Nausea, down. Vomiting, down. Fatigue, downregulated. Depression, markedly downregulated. When I show this to a psychiatrist, he said, this ought to be published independent of your Crohn's study. This is valuable information for psychiatry and depression. Activity is upregulated. These pa patients aren't sitting around smoking pot, couch lock. They're getting up and going and becoming more active in their lives because they can use cannabinoids. Weight, mildly elevated. This population tends to be on the lean side because they lose weight. Using cannabinoids, they gain 12% weight. Flare-up frequency and flare-up severity also markedly downregulated. These are the comments that these patients say. All 38 patients say these same things. In the end, it brightens my mood and makes me smile. You know, it really works for these patients, and it's been great to be associated with a large number of patients with Crohn's disease. Cannabinoids for dermatologic problems. Cannabinoids, cannabis oils, are sunscreens in and of themselves. They have therapeutic values in acne, psoriasis, keratosis, and skin cancers. There are, skin, there are CB1 and CB2 receptors in the skin, and activation does inhibit tumor growth. Uh, I've cited the papers by a few of these different authors. Uh, they're looking at some of the non-psychoactive cannabinoids, CBD, CBG, and others, as they may be particularly useful in treating these various skin conditions. This is a lady from Australia. On the right side, you'll see her nose before putting cannabinoid oil on it. Her dermatologist had already treated a few basal cell carcinomas in this woman. When she asked about using cannabis oil, he said, go ahead. He didn't biopsy this particular lesion, so we don't really know that it was a basal cell carcinoma. I'll take the dermatologist's opinion. 10 days of cannabis oil, just keeping the concentrated oil on the skin for 10 days, and you see the lesion has disappeared. This is not uncommon when it comes to treating skin cancers with cannabis oils. And one of my patients took a before and after shot on an acti actinic keratosis on his cheek. He put the oil on a spot band-aid for about a month. The lesion peeled off and hasn't come back after a few years. So again, these proliferating cells that are related to cancers, they're not really cancers, they do respond to cannabinoids. Not all skin lesions do, but it's worth using. That's the end of my talk. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jeffrey Hoganrather.